Welcome back to another edition of Components Breakdown. Today we are going to look at a game that was released in Europe at the tail end of 2010 called Antics. It is a three to four player game that takes about an hour to play. In Antics, each of the players will control their own ant colony consisting of 12 total ants. Now these ants will be used through the course of the game to gather leaves, fight off other colonies, and hunt for prey. All of which can be done by building an anthill that is completely customizable to each player's own liking. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at the game. In order to best explain the gameplay and mechanics and antics, it's going to be most beneficial to first walk everybody through the setup of a four-player game. Now, at the start of the game, each of the players is going to receive all 12 of their ant meeples, of which 11 of them are going to be placed off to the side into what is known as their personal supply. And one of them is going to be placed on the giant ant hill near the center of the game board. Each player is also going to receive one starting ant hill tile, and one larger anthill base. The anthill tile is again going to be placed off to the side into their personal supply and the anthill base is going to be placed directly in front of them and it's going to give them all five of their available actions right at the start of the game. Each player is also going to receive what is known as the Magnificent and their player collar as well as three colored action markers and a player aid to sort them through each of the available turns. Board is then going to be seated with both prey and leaves. The prey are going to be stacked three high on the marked locations on the game board for a four player game. The leaves are then going to be placed one per space on the ten marked areas of the game board, resulting in a total of five brown leaf and five green leaf locations once all of them have been placed. Across the top of the game board are six scout fields and they're going to be set up as such. The players are going to take all 60 of these smaller anthill tiles in the game and they're going to mix them into the provided bag and they're going to randomly draw and place three tiles per column in fields numbered 1 through 5. Now if any of the tiles drawn at the start of the game show a fungus icon on them, they will instead be placed in the highest available field and a new tile will be drawn. So you'll be placing the number one, two, three, four, and finally the fifth column. Next players are going to randomly place three of the double-sided anteater tiles into the final column number six. Now, after all this is done, the last action that's going to take place during the setup is the double-sided anteater guide will be placed to the left of the scout fields depicting whether it's going to be a three or a four player game depending on which side is uh, placed upwards. Let's go ahead and take a look now at the gameplay. The scoring in Antics is a victory points based system in which players can earn recognition for two very specific types of things in the game. The first of which is collecting unique types of prey. And the second is collecting leaves that can then be placed on their acquired fungus tiles at the end of the game. So the goal of the game is actually incredibly simple to understand. And that is to collect as many of the limited amounts of prey tokens as possible and build your anthill high enough to earn points for your combinations of leaves and fungus at the end of the game. So we'll come back to both of these things a little bit later when we get to the end of the rules explanation. So what players really need to do in Antics is to create a network of ants in order to transport as many of these two things, being prey and leaves, back to the central shared anthill near the center of the game board. However, ants do not move in this game, which is one of the unique features. They act more like trains in most games in which networks will be chained together by ants being placed into several of the different locations on the board, which will then allow the players to transport tokens through these ant chains back to that central anthill. So how is all this done exactly and what actions are available to the players to be able to fulfill these two goals in the game? On a player's turn, they're allowed to perform three total actions using the three colored player markers that they started off the game with. Now, there are five possible actions that are available at the start of the game, all of which are located on that player's starting anthill base. Now, to take an action, a player simply takes one of those colored markers and places it on one of the actions available to them. As I said, there are five possible actions available. Let's go ahead and take a look at each one in turn. Looking at the anthill base, we're going to talk about each one of these five actions. 
in a little more detail. The first action we're going to talk about is called scouting or taking tiles. Now the tiles that we previously used to set up next to the game board are what is known as the scouting fields. They were numbered 1 through 6 at the start of the game. Now whenever you perform the scout action by taking your marker and placing it on this scout icon, you are allowed to take a singular tile from the scout field according to the level of the action that you take. We'll talk about levels in just a moment, but for a level 1 action you simply take one tile of your choice from column 1 and place it into your supply. That is what a scouting action does. The second action available to each of the players is called building your anthill. Now when you perform this building action, you take one of the anthill tiles from your personal supply and you build it onto your anthill. Now by doing this, you can either make your anthill taller or you can make it wider. But there are several rules that govern the way in which an anthill must be built. And some of those include they must be touching another tile. So you have to have one central ant anthill uh, throughout the course of the game. Also, you cannot overhang another tile. You also cannot build over prey, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But most important of all is that when you build on top of other hills, you must build over two tiles. You can't place it on top of one singular tile. The third available action to each of the players is called hatching. Now, in order for them to get their ants from their personal supply in front of them onto the game board, they're going to have to use this hatch action. And it's going to allow them to place ants from that supply onto any of the six nests uh, of the hatching area at the bottom of the game board. Now, a simple rule is that if players should ever happen to hatch two or more ants in one particular action, the first two of those have to be placed in the exact same nest. Any further ants that happen to get placed can be placed in other nests as they see fit. The fourth action that is available to each of the players is called deploying ants, or simply ants. Now in order for players to build their network of ants onto the game board, players are going to have to use this action space to place their ants from the hatchery onto the corresponding paths of the game board that match that specific visual location. Now there are five different types of paths in the game, all of which match one of the five different hatcheries at the bottom of the game board. Now in doing this, players must make sure that the network leading back to the central anthill always stays connected at all times, meaning that players must initially place their ants in such a way that they sprawl out from that central anthill. Now it needs to be noted that players can share the same path as other players' ants, but typically only one of their own ants may be on a path at any given time. Now, for those who may have noticed, there is a sixth type of hatchery spot on the bottom of the game board and it does not match any of the other locations. So this is called the Soldier Ant Hatchery and it plays a very special role in the game's design. Now Soldier Ants provide most of the conflict aspects of the game and they allow players a couple of different options when they choose to use them. Now one of the options is the Soldier Ants can be used to attack other players who may have a prey or a leaf on them. Now, if you have your own personal ant on the same spot as another player's ant who may be carrying one of these two tokens, you may hatch one of the soldier ants to rip that specific token out and place it onto your own ant. Once that action is done, you take that soldier ant and you put him back into your supply since he's been used up. The second thing you can do with a soldier ant when you play the deploy ant action is to protect one of your own ants. And this is simply done in the opposite way. If you have somebody carrying a token, you can put one of your soldier ants next to him to protect that same style of attack happening to you. And the third and final ability that the soldier ants are allowed to do is to cross the giant chasm at the top of the game board. Now if players at any time have three soldier ants in their hatchery, they may use a level three deploy ant action to build a bridge across that chasm and it just simply allows for quicker access to several of the tokens at the top of the game board. The fifth and final action that players can take on their turn is called heaving and when players heave they're allowed to transport any prey or leaf that is connected in their network back to the original anthill at the center of the board. Now, the number of spaces they're allowed to move that particular prey or leaf between their ant network is completely dependent upon the level of the heave action that that player takes. 
Now that I've explained the five basic actions that players can take on their turn, it's imperative that I show you the core mechanic of the game and how all these actions that I've shown you thus far can be further expanded upon and customized to your own style of play. Everything that I have described to this point is referred to players taking what is known as level one action, such as scouting for one tile, or building one tile, or hatching one ant, and so forth. As players build their anthills higher though, the actions that they take become more numerous. Let's give you a couple quick examples. For instance, a scout action that is two tiles high allows players to not only take that level one tile, but also a level two tile from the scouting fields. A build action that is three tiles high allows players to take a level three build, which allows them to place three tiles from their supply onto their anthill. So in essence, each of these five available actions that I just showed you can be expanded upon in this way, which really speeds up the player's ability to do a lot of these actions quicker and more efficiently through the course of the game. This is the core mechanic of Antics, and it is a remarkably interesting mechanic to witness in action. Now, there will be many times when players accidentally build over a tile that they may have needed, essentially sort of blocking them out completely of an ability to take a specific action for the rest of the game. This is where the Magnificent uh, token comes into play. Now the Magnificent Action token kind of acts like a Joker and it allows a player once per turn to take any action that they so desire out of those five available. But the only caveat is that it has to be a level one action. So once a player has taken all three of his available actions, there's going to be a very short cleanup phase that's going to take place. The first thing he'll do is he'll remove all of the action tokens or markers off of his personal anthill and place them back into his supply to be used again on a later turn. The second thing that will happen is any prey that they have heaved back to the central anthill in the middle of the game board must now be stored onto their personal anthill. What this does though is it effectively blocks out that specific space for the rest of the game. So you can't use it for actions and you most definitely cannot build over it. So there's going to be some strategy throughout the course of the game on how you build your anthill. If a player ever heaves back a leaf instead of a prey, they do not have to be placed on the anthill, but can instead be placed back into the supply off to the side of that player's um, play area. The third thing that's going to happen is if a player happened to use the scout action that turn, he must refill the scout fields by shifting all the empty rows to the left effectively filling all the spaces with new tiles from the bag. Now as you've noticed there are anteaters that will gradually make their way towards column one and if this should happen on a player's turn a very special anteater phase will take place and two very specific factors will control what that anteater does. First the anteater card that is off to the side stating to you what that anteater will eat and the second thing whether or not it is the first, second, or third anteater to arrive at column one. So in a four player game, the first and second anteaters that arrive at column one will eat prey off of the game board of that anteater's matching color. While the third anteater to arrive will eat both a prey of its matching color and all of the ants in the hatchery that match that anteater's color. If no ants are there at that specific time, he just keeps traveling in the direction of his nose until he finds a hatchery that does contain ants, of which he will eat. Now this will happen for all three of the ant eaters until they all arrive at column one. When that happens, they are simply turned over to their opposite side, placed in column six, and will again work their way towards column one as the game progresses. And that is antics in a nutshell. This kind of gameplay will continue in this fashion until one of two conditions are met. Either you cannot refill the scout fields due to not having enough ant hill tiles in the bag, or if there is only one kind of prey still available on the board. When either of these two things happen, each player is going to be allowed one additional turn to gather as many victory points as possible. Scoring in the game is done as follows. Now, for each unique type of prey that a player has on his anthill, he's going to square that total. So, for instance, if he has just one unique prey at the end of the game, he's going to score one point. If he has two unique prey on his anthill, he's going to get two points for each of those prey for a total of four points. Fungus, however, are scored entirely different. 
and only count points if a player has combined them with leaves that they have collected throughout the course of the game. Now, at the end of the game, players will place their leaves from their supply onto any of the available fungus spaces on their anthill and will score X number of points depending upon how high that fungus tile is. Therefore, a level 2 fungus with a brown leaf on it scores them 2 points. A level 5 fungus with a brown leaf on it will score them 5 points. Players will also get an additional 2 points for each of these specific areas if there is a green leaf that is used instead. Now thematically that simply states that it is a fresher leaf so to speak. Now after that fairly lengthy rules explanation, Antics is still a very simple game to play. There's not a whole lot of rules that dampen the gaming experience or bog it down to an unplayable pace, making for a very solid game for a variety of different levels of gamers. It's very quick to play and it's intuitive even after the first round of play and the theme is completely unique and it doesn't take itself too seriously. So it's easy to get yourself wrapped up in the charm of building your own anthills to your own desires. Now, what I really truly enjoy most about the game though is that it is almost completely luck free. Almost everything you do in the game comes from the simple knowledge that you see on the board. There's no dice, there's no hidden cards. And all the information is right there for you to see at all times. Now, for those who enjoy lots of interaction between players in a game, I think that there is just enough in here to allow gamers uh, the ability to both directly and indirectly annoy your opponents, either through the strategic use of the soldier ants in the game, denying other players valuable tiles, or even taking lots of tiles quickly through the scouting action to move the ant eater into position to both deny them prey or to eat a lot of their ants from the uh, hatcheries. Now, there's just a lot of cool things to think about in the game. Now, having said all that, I am one of those few people out there who very much dislike the game board and believe it is a truly hideous design that should have been alleviated with a little more attention to the design work behind the game. Now, as pathetic as that may sound, it's distracting to me. And I just think that it could drive away more people than what it initially draws in. Also, I have to note to everybody that on the initial production run of the game, the wooden components that were shipped, especially the white and the wooden colored ones, are very similar in color. Now, the publishers have come out and said that they will take care of this for anybody who is interested in getting replacement parts, but just note that they are very similar, and for those that are colorblind, they're going to have trouble differentiating their components from another player's components. So. Just note that. Now, but all in all, though, Antics is just a very fun game to play, and I stress the word fun. It's very lighthearted, it's easy to learn, it's easy to teach, it's very intuitive, and it has just enough depth in it to make each decision that you make from round to round really, really important, especially due to all the very limited resources in the game that will score you points. So, that is Antics. I am Jeremy Salinas, and thank you very much for watching.